Here, kids, here's some free drugs. Start playing Dota 2 again. Well, now that I'm a content creator, I rarely write code. Yeah. <laughs> So, I am back with TJ. You were episode number one. Did you know that? I did know that. Numero uno. <laughs> yep. And then I had uh, Melky's background. I didn't know how many times that was going to be, you know, reused in clips and stuff like that with uh, <laughs> Melky's <laughs> office picture. But uh, that's all right. You know, it was uh, it was funny. And I'm still yeah. laughing every time I see a clip. I'm like, that's all right. I, I decided it would be funny that day to put Melky's background on. <laughs> yeah, you were pimping out and shilling. You were promoting Melky. Let's let's put it that way. Now exactly. you need to promote yourself. Well, actually, it looks like you got Envim going on back there. I do. Yeah. So we got we got a little bit of Neovim background. You know, gotta show gotta show it off. Yeah, gotta rep it. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm into that. The big news here is that you're going to be writing a course for Boot.dev, which I'm obviously yeah. really excited about. Hopefully, lots more than one. But we're currently working on one. Yeah. Let's yeah. see if we can get you to one first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the goal, at least, is we're going to shoot for more than just one. Yeah. Yes, we definitely are. We talked about so many different things that you could write a course about. And off the air, we kind of landed on memory management. And, yeah. and that that course probably is going to be in C. Tell everybody why you think a course on memory management is so important for people learning back-end development for the first time. Yeah, there's sort of like two primary reasons I think that it's good for us to be thinking about. The first one is just recognizing that memory and memory management isn't just free, right? So even though it may never appear in the code that you're writing, particularly if you're writing garbage collected languages, you'll never sort of see, oh, like here's where it clears this array or frees this object or does some very expensive system operation and I can't figure out, you know, why my app, it seems to be slower than it should be, right? Like there's no sort of explicit time where you write that, at least in general, sort of like everyday today dev. So it's really good, I think, to expose new devs to this concept. Like this is sort of, you know, what's happening. And obviously like production garbage collectors are very complicated. They do much more than just what appears from a regular Malik and free and some of the other stuff we'll talk about in the course. But it, it, it at least is doing something right and memory is like real and it's still running on a computer even if we're far away from uh, actually the ones and zeros and then the other side of that is as you sort of branch out into other options for back-end development particularly if you you know actually have users and maybe need to scale or it needs to go fast right you might need to write some parts maybe of your back end service in a non garbage collected language and or um you know one of the things that we're shooting for later as a, a f future sort of potential course is writing some rust stuff and if you want to write rust you really need to understand some of the problems that it's trying to solve and those problems land in the middle of this manual memory world and garbage collected world and you know rust's borrow checker and, and some other things which maybe we can talk about later sort of solve those in a very unique and different way from a lot of the other main mainstream languages that are that are around right now so it's sort of both of those things you know sort of just giving you this concept of oh that's right like you know i made an array of a million elements and then like i don't need it anymore Th but silly that, me like how did i forget yeah <laughs> right that still does something on the computer right or if you're doing something where you're creating a lot of intermediate you know arrays of items it's still like cost something and maybe it won't make any difference for your app. That's okay. But even just having that sort of in your mind and understanding that is really, I think important, particularly on the back end, where, you know, occasionally you have to do something over maybe thousands or millions of records, right? You got to sort of start having that in your, in your mind and thinking about. It. So that's kind of where we landed, landed for this and figured as well, like overall, should just really be exposed to something that's not garbage collected by the time that you're done. Even if you then go back to only writing garbage collected languages, that's totally fine. Yeah, I write Go. So Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, actually, like, in all seriousness, I've had to debug more memory issues than, like, any other kind of performance issues in my Go applications. Not because, like, I have the, you know, the, the traditional, like, really scary memory problems that you get in C, 
right? Yes. Where the program's like literally crashing or there's like an actual memory leak. But I'm just like allocating a lot of memory and I don't know where, <laughs> right? Yes. And I have to like mm -hmm. go figure out where that's happening. And the garbage collector actually can make it really hard to figure out where that's happening because it has its own little algorithm for when it's cleaning up the memory. So like you're trying to profile it and you don't know when things are happening and it gets, uh, gets pretty tricky. Yeah, I think in Go as well, Although it's not exactly the same as C, there are some things with slices and thinking about like appending to a slice or, you know, like a list where you end up if you if you don't understand sort of what Go is talking about when it sort of says that this thing is like a pointer to a slice, you know, or a reference to a slice or whatever, you know, how people colloquially want to say that you'll end up really confused why you have to like set the thing equal to appending something to the thing right and you're like that doesn't make any sense because like in python i just do like result dot push or something like that right and so so some of those even in go you actually will have a better understanding or like not false for some common like pitfalls if you understand that and understand oh it has to reallocate later so that it can be a contiguous memory of python, blah, blah. you know so so i think that that even in even in go which is kind of like in a weird middle ground spot compared to some other garbage collected languages uh go is in some ways you know very c programmer minded i think well it is a ken thompson yeah <laughs> it is a ken yes, thompson like a, language so <laughs> yeah they they still like c they just didn't like c plus plus is my understanding so they wanted something you know that solved some of the things that were difficult to solve with c plus plus but without having to write c you know like they wanted strings for example and it's like yeah. okay that's a little bit easier now you know so they they had some other stuff like that or like you just run go build and it works right so <laughs> right um, you know and no memory problems in the same way um for like use after free or stuff like that you can't do that and go because you have a garbage collector before we go on i need i need yeah. to plug your coupon code so even though your course oh, hasn't come out idea. yet yeah yeah <laughs> you've got a coupon code it's teej t-e-e-j Anyone yep. listening to this podcast can go use the coupon code, get 25% off their first payment of boot dev, and you get a slice of that cash money dollar bills. Indeed. Uh, so if you're excited for TJ's course, you can use that promo code. Okay, so I want to talk just a little bit about like where we're fitting this memory management course into the curriculum, because as most of the people listening to this podcast know, boot dev is kind of organized in this linear fashion. We've got like 23 courses and you take them top to bottom, assuming that you're fairly new to programming. Sometimes we have like senior developers come in and do it in whatever the hell order they want. But most people kind of go top to bottom. And in the current Learn Go course, which is one of our like flagship, like larger courses, we actually do talk a bit about memory. There's like maybe a chapter and a half total, maybe two chapters where we're talking about like the difference between compiled languages and interpreted languages and the fact that Go is garbage collected and how it you know, how you can compare Go's like memory usage, like from a performance standpoint against like languages like Java and Rust. My thought process is this course is basically going to, I don't know if replace is the right word, but it's going to teach what I was trying to teach within a chapter and a half in much more detail, much more depth. <laughs> Yeah, so I think currently we have it slotted, at least ideally, sort of just before you do this Go course. In particular, like I just mentioned, there's some things where if you understand the memory model of some of the things you're talking about with C, Go makes quite a bit more sense, as well as like, it's just, it's a good spot sort of in the curriculum where, okay, I've written some code, we're going to do some compiled things, what is compiled, and then we're going to sort of expose you to those. So I think that that like is a really nice, at least tentative spot where we've got it right now, which I'm I'm excited for. I mean, we're about to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found that my students will let me know if they don't like something. <laughs> True. Yeah, maybe we'll look back on this and in the comments, everyone's telling us that we should have put it somewhere different and then maybe it will be. <laughs> yeah, we just move it. It's not that hard. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question for you. There's a lot of React Andes out there to use mm. kind of Prime's term, that want to learn Rust because it's yep. hot and it's sexy. True, true. <laughs> true. Should yeah. Rust be a first or second programming language? Or really, I, I should say, should Rust be a first programming language or should you learn C first and why? So this is a question that I've asked myself a lot of times. There's some difficulties with having it be a first, but there's also some things that are really good about it. One thing that I think is really difficult about having Rust as your first language is it's very difficult to sort of 
I don't empathize is the wrong word, but like empathize with the problems that Rust is trying to solve, right? And so you end up in these situations where you're sort of, you're feeling you're really fighting the compiler and you're never able to understand why does this even matter? And particularly if you're new to programming, it's going to yell at you a lot because you don't get why doing this reference in this way is the same thing or putting it in a for loop makes it broken or, you know, so, so there's a bunch of stuff where as you, if you're new, you're going to really, I think, have a hard time because you don't get why it's trying to solve that, right? On the other hand, there are a lot of really good things about Rust to introduce new programmers because it can teach them a lot of really good habits <laughs> and, and you can, and you can get, if you're willing to sort of sit down and struggle through some of those things with the borrow checker and focus on how do I, how do I really understand it? Not how do I please the borrow checker, right? But how do I understand this? You can gain a lot of really great insights about programming. I think that may not be evident to you, you know, at first, sort of this idea of, well, we're not going to have shared mutability, or I'm going to be able to pass something immutably. And, and you sort of miss those things when you go to a different language, and, and you're not sure, like, in Go, is this thing going to get changed out from under me or not? I have no way of knowing and no way asserting in the type system, right? So I would say there are certain people who who would probably like Rust a lot as their first programming language, but it's really far away, I think, generally speaking, from like starting to getting to see something happen. And I think that feedback loop and iteration loop is really, really important, particularly for the first like little bit of doing programming. Maybe after you do a little bit of programming and you're like seeing things happen and stuff like getting printed to the screen or like, you know, a web page is showing up or whatever the sort of like first project you're doing and that's like you know one of the things i like about boot is project based instead of just like we're gonna sit and listen for six weeks and then we're gonna write our first line of code like i don't think that that hooks people in the same way as sort of getting them to somewhere and they're writing something right and so that part i think is really difficult to do in rust right so from a like psychological standpoint, I guess, you know, armchair psychologist over here in my basement. I think it's hard for me to say Rust would be a great first programming language, but I do think it has a lot of potential as a second programming language that you're willing, if you're willing to be like, I, I really want to learn it, not just I thought it was cool. So I want to put it on my resume or something, then you probably won't have any fun. <laughs> Yeah, fun with it, if that makes sense. Travis Wagner was on the pod a while ago, and, and I think what he said was nobody's ever tried. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've never met anyone that like started mm -hmm. with Rust, right? Yeah, you hear the you hear the people that went to university and started with Python. That was me. Uh, started with yep. Java. Started Same. with C, C plus plus. But like, never heard. Oh, Camel. If you go to Cambridge, I think. Oh, but not yeah. That wasn't you. That wasn't me. No, I discovered it much later in life. You know, but uh, <laughs> there are some people, the blessed few. <laughs> the blessed few that went to Cambridge. <laughs> did you go to like a fancy, did you go to a fancy college? I mean, I went to a small like Christian liberal arts school, Calvin College. So I don't know. It wasn't super fancy. I lived at home. So it didn't yeah, feel mine super wasn't fancy, fancy and I lived at home too. <laughs> this is how you get successful is you don't yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. I because... mean, I liked it a lot. I My professors were helpful and wanted me to learn. So that seems like an effective <laughs> effective strategy well i think i think like when you go to an ivy league school and don't drop out like that's a signal that you're actually not that good right because like all the Dang. best all the best <laughs> stanford students are the ones that drop out they to leave. work at a startup yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> if you go to no a comment you college, can dig yourself no in your own hole <laughs> <laughs> i enjoy it down here yeah yeah that's interesting so i actually yeah i have a couple like theories again i don't know anyone that's tried rust and i feel like we should run that experiment on some poor soul like just just jump right into rust but what i have found just like to nerd out about instructional design for a second is that that why question like why am i doing this why am i doing that is the most important question to answer and it's really hard to effectively teach how to do something if the why isn't crystal clear yeah i would say as well particularly for like online situations where it's a lot of self-directed learning it seems even harder to start with rust as your first language perhaps you could make the argument you know for like if you had some one-on-one -on -one personal tutor right then maybe that could be that could be a very different situation but you know like i'll probably teach my kids rust first you know what i mean you know? <laughs>
We'll finally have a sample size. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'll be able to fi- we'll be come back to me in, you know, 10 years and I'll be able to let you know. But but it's really hard, I think, when you're doing a lot of self-motivated learning and other stuff like that to to sort of struggle with what seems like should be something really simple. You know, like I just want to pass this thing to a function and now I can't do it twice. And you're like, oh, my God, I don't understand. This is terrible. Right. And. And then it's really hard, even if you can sort of figure out what the rules are, to relate to those problems that it's getting solved to, right? So the why is really, I think is really hard to come across in sort of like a self-driven, self-directed style, like learning thing for Rust to be first. There is a huge difference between online. It's really the self-motivated learning. There's a big difference between self-motivated learning and learning where I would kind of classify it as there's external pressure, right? So like when I went and got my CS degree at the local community college and was living at home for the first year, like there was a ton of external pressure. Like if I don't go to school, like literally my mom upstairs is going to be mad at me, right? Like I've got to go to school. If I get bad grades, I lose my scholarship. Or mom will be mad at you, which is and probably mom will worse, be mad right? At me. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like there's there was financial incentive. There was social incentive. Like my friends knew I was in school. I didn't want to tell them that I dropped out. Like, you know, parents being disappointed, like kicking out, whatever. There's tons of external pressures. When you're learning online, there's very few boot dev students that have any external pressures, really. There's like maybe a couple examples of like a mom or a dad bought a membership for a student, but it's like a very, very small pressure in comparison to what you get at like a university. And and that's why, you know, kind of again, to nerd out about the instructional design of boot dev is like, that's why we're so into this like gamified dopamine, make sure you understand the why, make sure you're building projects because like you have to find that motivation somewhere if it's not coming from an external source. Yeah, 100% agreed. And I think making it fun is a super great way to sort of build that momentum and build that sort of like motivation to actually accomplish it. And I think, you know, in sort of my mind's eye of how some of this could work out for like a Rust course down the road is, you know, you've done some garbage collected ones, languages, and then you've interacted with C and you've sort of seen, okay, so we're manually memory managing these things, blah, 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 right? This is cool. But then sometimes you just like free it twice or n- never allocate or like allocate twice or you just went past the end of a, you know, you're like, oh my goodness, why, why are all of these things like so hard and they're so easy to make a mistake on? Then like Rust's motivating examples become really clear. And oh, I see like the borrow checker is replacing you know the garbage collector and it's replacing <laughs> the manually mem- like manually thinking about memory right and so you sort of see this and so you're trading off some difficulty from the compiler right and sort of on the static analysis side to get those things um happening for you without any performance in, in fact like with performance improvements compared to a lot of other things right because you're not doing a bunch of extra work so that part i think then like the why is exciting. Oh my goodness, you know, that's crazy. Plus there's a bunch of other like fun, you know, well-designed parts of Rust besides just the borrow checker that I think like will come to be appreciated as sort of like this whole package there. The borrow checker is here to pleasure me. I'm not here to yeah. pleasure it. Yeah. Right, yeah, like it's serving me, right? That's how it's, they phrase uh, it, right? I didn't... I think that's directly out of the Rust book, yeah. <laughs> exactly Rust those words, yeah. Mm-hmm. Man, Rust C... Yes, exactly. That's the synopsis. Yes, the TLDR for that (laughs) whole thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This course is happening. I'm super excited for it. One thing that has been top of mind for me. Well, let me back up. We've I just launched this course. Well, it'll be out by the time this podcast is out on shells and terminals. Mm -hmm. And the thing about shells and terminals is that when you're trying to learn how to use a shell or a terminal, you're you're really just kind of like moving around a file system, maybe grepping some stuff. you're you're dealing with console output. It's a very different problem set than like complete this Python function, right? Which Definitely. is a, a good amount of like um, the Python course and and probably a good amount of what this C course would be, I imagine, like mm-hmm. kind of completing functions that do things with memory. So we actually had to build a new feature into boot dev to support the shells and terminals course, where basically you like paste your, the output in your terminal, like just just copy paste 
from your terminal into the browser and have it check and make sure that you did everything correctly. Nice. Um, because the whole game loop of boot dev is based on like, did you do this correctly? And if yes. you don't, right. then like you lose XP or you lose your bonus or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get the achievements as fast. So we have to build this <laughs> for, for C and for memory management. Because again, this is a new topic. Have you thought about this at all? Like how are we going to get this working in the platform? Yeah, so the... Like my first thought, and I've had some good sort of like initial signs on this, is there are a few sort of like C to WASM compilers, and some of them can run in the browser, so we can compile it to C. And then a, a lot of the stuff that we can do, we can sort of just write, you know, asserts about what we're expecting to see happen and just run a regular sort of testing style thing. One of the things that's nice, right, about the kinds of projects that I want to do in the C course, which primarily like after the introduction and, and sort of basics, we're working up towards writing a ref counting garbage collector and a mark and sweep garbage collector is sort of the two, I don't know, capstone parts of the project or however you want to say it. And you can just like run something and then at the end you can just check <laughs> if you freed it, right? So like the the test harness itself, it should be able to just sort of make some assertions about that and uh, like a classic no thing you would do in C is we can just if def in some stuff inside or whatever we need to do to like check how many times we've called malik or check how many times we've called free and stuff and so we can do some sort of like post hoc assertions after you've done sort of this gambit of okay we're going to reference this list and then we're going to put another thing inside the list and then we're going to D, we're going to sort of free the list, but like that extra thing still has a reference holding on to it. So like that should still exist, right? So we can we can do that. And then what's really fun is you can just you just check the memory and see and 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 that should be like just fine. So that's sort of the the goal of what I want to do there. And and through that, you'll learn a lot, I think, about just how, you know, the basics of memory management and see as well as though it's sort of fun. It's like tricking you into learning some basics about how garbage collectors work <laughs> in other languages too, right? Obviously, Java's garbage collector is going to be a lot more complicated than the one that we write over one course. And probably worse, to be honest. Yeah, actually, JVMs is one of the best. But anyways, um, <laughs> I know, sorry. Sorry to burst your bubble on that one. <laughs> but at least like some of the concepts when you hear mark, it's a, it's a mark and sweep or it's a ref count or, you know, it's a generational GC, those things will like go over and you'll be, ah, like I, I see it. You, you know, a, a cool example is in OCaml, OCaml has a generational garbage collector, which pretty much just means like it has a minor GC and a major GC. and you you fill up your minor GC over time. And then when it fills all the way up, and sometimes you free stuff in the middle, only the things that have lived long enough to survive an entire minor GC like loop get moved to the major heap. So this lets you write programs like particularly in OCaml where you're writing lots of stuff with sort of functional style, immutable stuff, you sort of make something and discard it sort of regularly, even more so maybe than certain imperative paradigms, right? You you end up getting tons and tons of savings because you have this minor GC that has completely different like profile and algorithm and a bunch of other stuff in this minor, minor GC. And then only if something lives a long time, it gets moved to the major GC. So you like don't have to check those as often and do other stuff, right? So there's like a bunch of really cool things that people do to make their GCs go really fast. And what's also interesting is then they make them even go fast for the types of programs people tend to run or type, tend to write in those languages, which is also just really, really interesting to see. Functional programming in general tends to be, well the language itself tends to not care about performance, right? Like, uh, I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> let me assert it. Uh, okay. <laughs> so like, what I mean is like immutability, like at the language level, you're creating like new stuff all of the time. And that can't change, right? Like, for example, it is, it is cheaper a lot of times to reuse memory than to allocate new memory. Yes, definitely. Right? Now, what I'm getting at here is not to like accuse functional programming languages of being slow, but to say like, does that like, do you need to write a compiler 
and a garbage collector with that in mind, like knowing that you're going to have a lot more of that like reallocation, you know, due to immutability constraints. The nice thing about writing a language or like writing stuff for a language with immutability, particularly immutability by default is like the compiler can do a bunch of smart stuff that you could not do in a language without any mutability constraints, right? So um, you, you can just like, if they're the same value or something and the compiler could check that out, it actually doesn't even have to, you know, do anything, right? It, like it can actually know and maybe it doesn't, it puts that onto the stack instead of putting it onto the heap or keeps it inside of the function because you know that uh, this reference to a value above, it can't change. Referential transparency mentioned. Yes, nice. So, yeah. so immutability has a lot of really nice benefits for compilers and garbage collectors because they can make a lot of assumptions that you could not do say for like go right because there's no sort of you you can't know anything about this there's a lot of work being done in ocaml right now to bring it's done by jane street right now to bring some of the features sort of that the borrow checker has in rust into ocaml as well which could let you do even crazier stuff like saying this thing will never escape this scope so then instead of putting it into like either the minor or the major GC, it just goes onto its own stack. Like stack is way faster because then when we're done with this function, we just pop that off the stack and it's gone, right? And we're sort of just moving up and down the stack and there's no garbage collection like algorithm required, right? So, so I would say like saying that they don't care about performance, I, I like... Uh, I don't really think that that's like the right way to say. They just think immutability provides, generally speaking, like a good mix of performance and correctness. And a lot of times what you'll see is there will be some basically immutable API that might live on top of some mutable stuff that happens for when you need to do like a lot of a lot of stuff. Another example, I think it's in Clojure. They, I was reading some article about it a while ago, but they there's special data structures built to be able to do immutable sharing like really well. So you know maybe in JavaScript, if you want to have two copies of an array, the only way to like feel safe about sharing those is to literally deep copy it. Not just copy, right? But you need to like deep copy that. And sometimes you're still unsure. Well, <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know about JavaScript, but I've definitely done this in Python where I've like deep copied something and it's like, well, yeah, but you deep copied a reference. So like, yes, right. It's exactly. still the yes. same. <laughs> yeah, that's a separate, that's a that's even worse, right? But so like in, in some languages, then you sort of feel you need to defensively copy, right? So that you don't- I just loop through the whole thing and make them all again. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, no, I mean, sure. that's, that's what I'm saying. That's <laughs> defensively copying. I'm saying like, yeah. if you want to keep sort of the value that's been passed to you and do something with it, you feel like I really need to copy this because I have no idea if someone else is going to modify the reference to this thing later, right? But there's data structures designed to be like, you know, a shared hash map or something like that, right? Where you, or a shared list or whatever, right? Where then in because you know that it's immutable, when you sort of append one to it, you don't reallocate the whole list, you do something else with it, right? And so there's a bunch of really cool, you know, stuff that people do to make those fast, like in practice for people as they like, save off different chunks. Um, obviously, like, it's faster in C and just code it right, LOL. You know, like, just get good. Don't make a mistake. It can always be reduced to a skill issue. Right, yeah, it's like just don't make a mistake and don't have anyone else in the company change anything about the memory after you've saved a reference to it. Just don't do that. But that usually doesn't scale super, <laughs> super great. Even me in six weeks, it doesn't scale with super great, right? That's uh, that's one of the, the main problems. You can go there six too. weeks and retain the code that you wrote in your brain? Well, now that I'm a content creator, I rarely write code. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so...
but so so I don't know. So you know, I don't really like the functional programming doesn't care about you know performance. Like I think I can probably to write, be clear, uh, I never yeah. said functional programming doesn't care about performance, yeah. but I should have said that because it would have made a better YouTube short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think in general you would probably be like surprised at how fast a lot of the immutable stuff is because the compiler can do a lot of smart tricks. Right now, like a naive compiler or like an early version of even even like OCaml, right? It would be a lot slower because they don't yeah. have some of the same optimizations and other stuff. And I mean, plus they're just like find out novel research and stuff sometimes anyway. You know, there's like tons of stuff that happens there. But uh, but yeah, so so I don't know. You know, it, it's... I invite you to talk about a course on memory management and we just... St- we're just deep in functional programming again. I know. Well, this you is... brought it up. I was trying to talk about C, you know what I mean? And you're like, well, what do you think about Nobody will remember back being to when slow. I brought it up. <laughs> I'm like, you can't just let functional languages being slow be on my back end banter episode. Like, that's not happening. <laughs> Attention spans aren't long enough. You can just say whatever you want. People true. forget about it in 10 minutes. True, true, true. Mm-hmm. Speaking of functional programming. <laughs> nice. I'm ready. If you... Uh, have you played with Rock at all? The Rock programming language? I have seen it and I've like read through some of their docs and some examples and stuff, but I'm I have not tried it like personally. It sounds pretty interesting. I had Richard Feldman, the author, yeah. on about probably it's probably gonna be twelve episodes back since this one came out. But like the aim is kind of like we're gonna be in the performance class of Go and I'm not familiar with OCaml's performance class. I assume yeah. it's around Go go speed yeah it just it depends collection but like they're aiming to be in that kind of performance class and it's basically elm for the back end but anyways might be worth checking out if you're interested in those sorts of things yeah there's been a few people who have mentioned that it's uh that it's cool on stream when i'm writing ocaml you know people never want they always want to tell you that something else is cooler to try you know so okay so it's gonna be so funny the person who i'm talking about might know that i'm talking about them i won't say their name somebody went through the new shells and terminals course on boot dev today and like every single lesson they submitted feedback on so we have this little submit feedback or i should say the the button says report issue right because we want people to be able to like report a bug and also give suggestions let's just report issue and left a suggestion on every single lesson that i swear to god like you could have just inserted the south park like um actually uh (laughs) at the very top like and to be clear like it wasn't that what was said in the lesson was wrong it was just like i think there should be seven more paragraphs of explanatory text here uh (laughs) and what i found is that seven more paragraphs of explanatory text actually does deter learners a lot of the time yeah and it usually makes them miss the things that were in the original paragraphs (laughs) right so not only does it make them not want to do it but if they do they're more likely to miss the important points (laughs) of what you had said before (laughs) yeah exactly you can miss the 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 forest for the trees. I will say again, if you're listening and you think this is you, I still actually do appreciate you because it takes me all of three seconds to read that. And sometimes there is some really good stuff in there. And in particular with this person, they did actually have quite a few good reports that I did incorporate. So I do appreciate you, even though uh, it's hilarious. So, okay, we like circling all the way back to WebAssembly. We like WebAssembly was mentioned very briefly. Like we're going to take C, we're going to compile it to WebAssembly. We're going to run it in your browser while you're doing boot dev. And that's how we're going to do this memory management course. Are there any concerns? So like w- one concern I always have is like, sometimes we're we're teaching, well, let me g- give you the example of Go. We teach Go in the browser on boot dev. We compile it to WebAssembly. The hardest chapter to teach by far was the chapter on concurrency, because guess what? <laughs> WebAssembly is single threaded in the browser, right? So trying to explain like why you would want to spin up multiple Go routines and like have a race condition is really hard when a, a, a true race condition where like two you know threads are literally trying to access the same memory at the same time is actually impossible in WebAssembly. So that was a problem. Do you foresee any problems with doing this course in WebAssembly rather than compiling to machine code? The only things that I really see is sort of like maybe being annoying is like getting different error messages and stuff based on that's sort of my main concern. One of the things I still sort of need to flesh out in that area. But fortunately, my suggestion is if you have to write a bunch of multi-threaded stuff, like I would just say don't use C. So 
<laughs> so like, <laughs> so I would, you know, some of those problems like are sort of, we can just sidestep because I, I would say pick, pick something hand else. wave them away. Yes. It's my favorite um, and, teaching method. Yeah. Yeah. And the primary thing we're trying to focus on in the course is just like allocate and free. And like Wasm knows that it does. It knows how to do that. And that's, that's definitely sort of where I want to keep things in. I don't want to explore too many others. You know, people are like, well, why not do like one, like this one doesn't work on multiple different threads. You know, we're like working on it on Twitch and stuff. And I'm like, but you don't understand. This is supposed to be to educate them about memory management and its concepts, not how to write a production grade, you know, garbage collector for your new programming language. That's a different course. That's, that's, you know, maybe later, but like, that's a different course. And so, so I think fortunately for us, like the, I, I've seen at least, you know, uh, some C, comp some was C to Wasm, I guess would be how you would say it, compilers. And they support all the simple stuff that, that we would need to be able to do, which is, which is great. You know, we don't need to do latest C features, but, you know, we just want to show you, here's the basics. Here's how you can start doing this and then really get them thinking, oh, like Malik and free managing these. What is a pointer? What, what do you even mean? What is pointer to a pointer? Cause we're going to have to do some of those. You know, I think there will be a lot of sort of fun stuff like that. And all of those really fit in nicely with sort of the Wasm memory model and, and everything we need to do there. So hopefully fingers crossed, you know, we don't experience any sort of like weirdness on that. And I also don't plan on using any sort of like bizarre or exotic, you know, like standard library features or anything, right? It's like the only thing we need from the standard library is to be able to alloc and, and free, right? That's all we need. I just want to be able to allocate and free and that's all. So I think so that part works out pretty nice, I think, for sort of the boot dev style. The C standard library, it's been so long since I've done anything meaningful in C. The C standard library, is it as like self-contained as, for example, the Go standard library where it like ships with the compiler and everything? Or is it a little more work to get the standard library compiling into your program? So I mean, usually if you're building this on any sort of like reasonable setup, it it's very easy to include the standard library, but it's certainly not as full featured as goes, for example. And and you won't find like tons and tons of, I don't know, like data structures and stuff sitting inside of there. Those are primarily either sort of like people might hand roll them or there's a few sort of popular, I don't know, popular data structure like libraries, but you don't like install them with a package manager. You just kind of like vendor them into your project or literally like copy and paste them in somewhere and then include them, right? So that was the thing that blew my mind the most about doing yeah. like C and C++ in college. Like was, I remember I started with Python. So like I'd pip install some stuff, which by the yeah. way, like pip is also a fucking nightmare. So like- it it does not work that all, all, that often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not like I'm not advocating for that. But like <laughs> in C and C++, it feels like a caveman or at least who knows if I was doing it the right way. But like yeah. all the recommendations seem to be go to this place online, copy this text, put it into your project. Congratulations. You now have a dependency. Yeah. There's sort of a concept of like header only libraries and they're like, everything is just like in the header file. And so you just include the header file and then you have that. I mean, in some ways it feels caveman, but in other ways it's like, you know, the cool thing, if it built today, it's going to build tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you, you know, you're like, yeah. man, PIP is nice until it doesn't work. You know, NPM's great until Trash Dev makes NPM everything. And now you can't delete anything from there. <laughs> he didn't you know, make like, that, did he? He helped. Yeah, he did. Oh, God damn it. Trash. A classic. Yeah. I knew um, he shared it. I wasn't sure. I didn't know yeah. he was the author. He was one of them. Yeah. So, so, but there's, there is something nice about that. And then the additional thing, right, is that if you need to change it, in any way for your thing it's like super easy because you've vendored it right so it's like yeah. oh okay this one it normally does this or it has these defaults or blah, blah. it's just like i'll just change it you know and that part right. that part's pretty pretty nice particularly you know for being able to actually like own a change and have it live for a while there's obviously some really big downsides like you don't really get updates <laughs> but a lot of the stuff that you would sort of do in this sort of header include style or things, a lot of them are kind of like pretty frozen anyways. You know, yeah. oh, this thing is like a standard vector, you know, thing or like I want to have a, a map 
Okay, well, the map isn't getting new functions <laughs> every day or something, right? You really don't need version 37.1. Like the one you have will work just fine for what you're doing. Now, you know. If it was JavaScript, you would because they, you they do. would be you do changing the... Uh... The yeah, API. you're right. You're you're like your office might get a little bit cold if you're not running npm update every morning, right? So it's like you kind of do need to make sure you're doing that <laughs> every day. But <laughs> there's that. I mean, I I greatly prefer something like Cargo over just directly <laughs> copying and pasting my vendors in. But that's, if your coworker that's the C doesn't way. allow you have a have a space heater at your desk because they get hot. Right. Npm yeah. actually can help out with that. Yeah, it's really that's probably like one of its primary uses is heating up people's offices, I think. So in fact, on the episode with Matteo Kalina, I, I distinctly mm -hmm. remember him talking about this. He's like, Oh, that's we good. Decided yeah. to make NPMI take really long and spin all the fans on your yeah. computer. It was a design and architectural decision from the start. Like a lot of people, it's cold. <laughs> um, and, and designing software that helps people. That's our goal here. <laughs> My train of thought has been completely <laughs> <laughs> completely derailed. Oh, yeah. um <laughs> I remember now. I was gonna say, like, this is why in Go I'm such a big fan of vendoring the vendor folder. Well, yes. I should say committing the vendor folder to source control, partly because it makes it more painful to have a large vendor folder. Right? Yeah. This is why we it is it is it is actually um a physical impossibility to commit the node modules folder. Right, um, because mm -hmm. it is it is the, the size of a neutron star. But in Go, it's usually mm -hmm. not a problem because you usually don't have that many dependencies. But it means, like you said, that you know if your repo builds on commit, it will build again on commit, yep. regardless of whether the remote dependencies actually are available or if you know trash devs somehow got commit level access to them. Right, exactly. Yeah, or you know, sort of just like you know, transitive depend. There's just so many things that can change when you're, when you're out there, which is like, generally speaking, like it's fine and it works out just fine. But that's sort of the, the C, the C way. I mean, I'm sure someone has a C package manager, you know what I mean? Like I'm sure that exists and, and people use it. I mean, in some ways, like I think it's called apt. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say in some ways, like apt and your system thing is like your C package manager, right. In the sense that you can install something and then you just are sort of expecting to be able to like dynamically link that at runtime. But that's stuff that I don't want to cover in the course because that's just like way too far afield, I think, for I, I my expectation is there's very, very few people who when they're done with boot dev are gonna like go and start writing C professionally. Like it's just not that common of like a back end sort of situation. That would be like a different career path entirely. Yes. Right. Yes. We we, we just Completely different idea and completely different, you know, thing we're shooting for. But I do think, I still think it's very helpful as like an educational tool and sort of to understand a lot of languages are either inspired by C or inspired to like fix something about C or, you know, inspired like in spite of C or something. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of sort of things there where you, oh, I see, I see why this thing's happening and, and and so I think it's still like really useful for someone who I think any software developer, but in in particular back end software developer to sort of get a feel for these kinds of things, because the ideas I, I'm not a huge fan of people like C is closer to the computer than like it's not. There's a lot of stuff that happens between the C code <laughs> that you write and like actually running on the computer. But a lot of things I don't I'm still like thinking of exactly how to say it, but a lot of things about C are sort of fundamental problems that you still have to solve, right? Which is like thinking about memory or thinking about, you know, accessing an array. And like in C, the solution was like, we'll just let you access past the end of the array. Yeah. Right? Actually, in like, Ruby, the, pro the, the solution is really easy, I found out. It's you just keep adding pods to the Kubernetes cluster. Yes. It's, yep. it's actually a solved problem. It does tend... To tend to be expensive but yeah that's right so it's like in c you think a little bit longer and you write something that goes faster and then in other languages like we just use more computers right and it's like okay it's still a <laughs> fundamental problem of computing <laughs> but but that's okay right so but there's a bunch of stuff like that right where you sort of see a design decision that maybe doesn't make as much sense or that you wouldn't like pick anymore because the constraints are way different in c it would have been just like too expensive to do something like check to see if this thing is out of bounds 
every time you accessed something in an array. And you're like, what do you mean too expensive to, to check something? Right? And you're like, no, you don't understand. They had like a few, you know, maybe thousand cycles a second instead of like a few billion, <laughs> right? And you're like, oh. And 18 cores on an M3 silicon chip. Right, and yeah. there wasn't like pipelining and and sort of like all this really advanced crazy stuff that happens inside of your CPU to guess what's going to happen next and branch condition, you know? And, and so <laughs> it was like actually really expensive to do something like we're going to store another bit of data for this, you know, or well, actually it'd have to be like a word size. So you're like, okay, well, it's a whole other byte usually or something or 64 bits or whatever, right? And then like, okay, every time we do like bracket N bracket, we're going to do like eight more operations to check to make sure that that's there. And like, maybe we're going to read memory over here. Like that was actually just not on the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and now you're like, yeah, okay, when in Python, when I call like bracket left bracket, it runs like eight functions, <laughs> se completely separate <laughs> functions before it even gets to deciding that we're going to check if this where this thing is in memory, right? And you're like, and that's okay for a lot of things. But seeing those things and sort of understanding and understanding why like, okay, and see this can be faster because it's doing way less. Oh, I, I get that. And and I think like that sort of idea of the different trade-offs and understanding more about the trade-offs and getting exposed to those trade-offs, really important part of like getting uh, like an education, particularly, like I said, like for backend stuff, I think it's, it's really helpful to, to do some of those things. Do you know what's crazy? I think in my entire professional career, there have been very few servers in like the backend architecture of the companies I've worked at that have been more powerful than my local dev machine <laughs> than my macbook yes. right? right so i'm usually mm -hmm. working on a macbook like you know one of the like ones that's come out in the last one or two years and most of the servers i deploy to are like running on kubernetes and like if you like took the whole cluster of machines like yeah there's more computing power but like my individual application i'm working on runs on like two pods that each have half a cpu or something um there's some exceptions there. Like I, I did like some stuff with a giant elastic search cluster, but like for the most part, application code I write, when I ship it up to the server, I expect it to have way less computing power than when I'm in local, which I don't think was always the case. Oh, definitely not. I mean, there used to not be local. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just like use a terminal to connect to the mainframe. Yes, right. Or, you know, like you you couldn't run it locally <laughs> like, yeah, it was too yeah. big for your local setup or something right so like you could just write code and then you would like i don't know deploy it later or something so yeah i think the the dynamics are very 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 different or even you know like it might be bigger but the loads you know like a million times bigger on you know your your server so then it's it's very difficult to to sort of figure out if problems that you're experiencing are like skill issue or you know like you just have a lot of things to do right <laughs> they're usually skill issue in my experience yeah. that yeah, might be that personal problem yeah yeah <laughs> yeah locally i have no data to test against and my and my macbook's very powerful on the server i have very little computing power because i'm cheap uh but mm -hmm. that's where all the data is so it's like right it's a huge, mm -hmm. huge skill issue. You'd think by now I would have solved it with like, I don't know, better dev environments or something. Yeah. One more thing that I've been thinking about a lot, more in regard to the educational design of, of, of the curriculum and with this new C course, is one service or one piece of value that I want to provide to boot dev students is to try to be very diligent about what we think you should know before you start your job search and what we think is like stuff that you can definitely learn after you've landed your first dev job, right? And there is no line in the sand. Like that is an impossible feat. You can't pick one. There's a bunch of junior devs out there that probably shouldn't even be employed because they don't know what they're doing. And there's a lot of people that are really experienced, Not just really junior talented. Devs. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's some there's some staff engineers at Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> that don't deserve anyways uh <laughs> the point is markets are efficient they're not that efficient and there's definitely some people employed that like probably have rightfully have imposter syndrome and there's also really talented devs that are not able to get work as easily as they probably should but there is this like gradient and i want to do the best we can there and with this course we decided to put it in the main learning path pre like first dev job. And I think a lot of like 
I don't know if this is a term you guys use, but WordPress Andes would look at that and be like, that is crazy. Like, go get a job. You don't need to learn memory management. My overall philosophy with learning to code is that erring on the side of just going a little bit deeper and learning a little bit more is the better overall strategy because it doesn't actually take that long and it'll make the actual job search easier. Do you have thoughts about this? Like, do you think it belongs there? Do you think it should be like an extra bonus course? What are, what are you, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so... I would understand that perspective a lot more if what we were sort of proposing with the course was like six months of intensive study on just memory management. I'd be like, (laughs) yeah, "Yeah, that does seem like something that should go later. (laughs) Like a (laughs) full semester. And that is one of the things, you know, when people think of like a course, maybe they're thinking like spending, you know, four months and like a significant amount of time. And you're like, well, I wouldn't take a course in college on memory manual memory management maybe you should i guess in college definitely i think at some point you should but like but i think just and and i've had some people say like oh it's premature optimization to even think about this and stuff and i just think mostly well one like i super agree with your point a lot of the things that have sort of propelled me along in my career are direct results of me being curious and wanting to learn more and not just like immediately getting just the bare surface level of what I can and then going to the next thing, right? Obviously, you have to do that some of the time. And there's lots of areas where my knowledge is like that. But lots of the things that have sort of moved me further in my career, given me new opportunities are because I I take some time to actually learn something. There may be something, I don't know, I, I have some sort of general thoughts that I'm still working on about like the advent of AI and some other things about if if you only ever want to learn the bare minimum top level stuff, then like AI might be more of a concern <laughs> for you than like someone who actually wants to learn something deeply and figures out, you know, some some more stuff there. So I think like that's the first part where being curious has been very advantageous in a career standpoint, not just, I don't know, like my inner feelings or my motivations, right? But actually like on the career side, curiosity has done that. And then the other side is that every program uses memory. But we're not saying like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm no, I'm crazy. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm really going to go there and say it. Every program uses memory, right? So there's something about like, okay, if every program uses this, there's at least maybe su- we should at least be thinking about exposing people to this concept, right? And And not just saying like every program uses memory, let's move to the next thing. Right. But like how how does a program generally allocate memory? It gets and like going through this idea of like, okay, you get like a block of memory and you can kind of like use that. But then you're sort of thinking like I add things to a list all the time. How does it know what to do with that? Right. And they're like, oh, it's going to have to reallocate. Oh, that's like expensive. And so even just sort of getting some of these ideas in your head to sort of understand what your program is doing, I think is like really, really good. Even if then you don't go back and write a bunch of stuff in C right afterwards, right? You, you you can sort of get some of those ideas and they help you understand what's going on in the computer, why some things might be slow. Because one thing that's definitely possible to do is you can take a problem that should not be slow and turn it into a problem that is slow. A lot of time that happens through lack of knowledge about something, right? And so... In web, it's like, usually a network call that you're doing <laughs> right. in a loop. <laughs> yep, network calls in a loop is an example. But then on the back end, it can be by doing something like a lot of it, like we've talked about, is like you, either you choose some really bad data structure and like after you learn hash maps, it's way less likely that you choose a bad data structure because like hash maps just tend to work out for a lot of stuff. But the another like really common one is you're doing something where you're creating a lot of memory, like you're using a lot of memory, either by like allocate and deallocating a lot or by like literally just putting a bunch of stuff in memory that doesn't need to be there, right? And so even just having this vague sense of like, okay, if I read some stuff out of the database and I'm gonna like touch it in my program, it's gotta be somewhere, (laughs) right? And and then you're like, oh, maybe I don't wanna read the whole database into memory, right? And like filter it on my program side. I need to figure out how to filter it in the database or something. Like just having a vague sense for that can be very, very helpful in backend engineering. And like, this is not gonna be a, you know, 500 course series, right? This is like a, we wanna get you in and out with a bunch of these things, get exposed to C, be able to have some general thoughts about it to not look like you've never programmed if someone asks you something related to C, right? Like in an interview and and then also sort of be able to talk about 
what even is garbage collection? What is manual memory management? And then, and then obviously lead you to the really, you know, handsome, sexy rust land afterwards where you're, you're, you know, going to try something different with, with borrow checking. But that's, so that's where I would say sort of like my thoughts are why I think it's really good to at least have, you know, some course that's introducing you and pushing you on these concepts a little bit to expose you to them. Even if then you never write C or even a manually, you know, managed thing at all. Part of it in my mind is, is, is just the, we want to give you a language to talk about this stuff yes. with mm-hmm. for yeah. exactly the reason that you mentioned. You show up to the interview, someone uses the word allocate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and right. you don't have to ask what the word hey, what's allocate allocating? means. Allocating. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cuz like right. It's not like that was a crazy hard technical question, right? Mm-hmm. You weren't jumping through hoops to solve leak code on a whiteboard. It's like yep. ju- it goes so far to just be able to speak like an engineer in an interview. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's very obvious when someone doesn't know what something means. Yeah. Like it's it's really hard to if you if you know what something is, but like you couldn't like you're you're not ready to write something in that thing right now, that's usually yep. okay. But you don't want that deer in the head the headlights look. That at least that's my yeah. experience in interviews. And I think, you know, as you start a junior dev job having the language to ask questions about things is really important too, right? So even just like being exposed to this idea, you may be able to ask a much better question to the senior you're working with and like actually get to solving the thing that you're getting paid to do because you have this general background knowledge instead of just being like frozen because the computer just like crawls to a halt when you're running this query, right? And you're like, I don't get it. Why does this happen in prod and not on my computer? What's happening? Right. And like, okay, yeah, well, here's what's happening. And then you have this, you have this clue, ding, ding, ding. That sounds kind of like memory. You're like, that sounds like we're allocating this a lot. Or like, why is there a lot of pressure? If someone says, why is there a lot of pressure on the garbage collector? You you like, actually, I get it. I wrote a garbage collector, a simple one, but like, I get, I get it. So I think there's, there's a lot of, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff there that I think is really, really useful to at least have, you know, some conceptual thing and i mean the other side is there is still like a huge world of people writing c or c plus plus today with they're just not on twitter they're not on twitter right because they're like making money and then spending time with their families you know what i mean so they like don't have time to argue about which javascript framework is better and whether we should be using like file routing or not you know they're not as concerned about deploying on vercel versus right yes they're just like what do you mean deploy we i have got the hardware right here we put it onto (laughs) this embedded chip and then we give it to the customer (laughs) so in fact the first place that i ever had like a programming internship we were i always joke we were full stack because we made the hardware and then wrote the firmware and software that went on there and i'm like you guys aren't full stack because you touch a database you're running on someone else's hardware you know like (laughs) and, and so you know there exists lots of people still writing writing things like that and it's probably good to at least like expose you know we're not going to do anything with you know embedded software but at least expose them to some of the tools that they could go like after you take the course you could probably write something for an embedded system right you could like actually do that um you would have a bunch of you know other problems to solve but at least you'd be like i can read the c code and understand some of these things that are happening right i mean then that's a way different world right then you really you might not be allowed to allocate <laughs> you might only have the amount of memory that you have and you have to figure out how you're going to just use allocate it, you know y- allocate your 800 kilobytes and right. that's you're done allocating good right, luck right yeah you get you get that at the beginning of the program <laughs> and then you figure out what you're going to put inside after that you know which is yeah. it's a very different very different world <laughs> but they exist those jobs exist yeah. people get them you know every day and they go work there so i think it's also nice on a back end sort of thing if we can sort of give them little peeks into different areas that would mm-hmm. be, you know, I don't know if you'd call embedded back end, you know, but it's like definitely yeah. not front end. It's right? closer. So if, <laughs> right. So if you're a software developer and you think all that exists, right, is front end and back end, right? Like it's definitely not the front end one, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so there is something I think nice, at least from my perspective of like, giving people little peeks into different areas be like, oh, that C thing was like really interesting. That was like, yeah, really crazy. I want to do more of that. And you're like, sweet, the, you know, and it's possible to get jobs, get jobs doing that, you know? So I think there's lots of cool stuff um, there. 
Yeah. Well, one thing I've mentioned in the past to students that have asked is like, at the moment, boot dev is laser focused on back end development. And an, mm -hmm. until we are like so satisfied with where mm -hmm. that curriculum's at, we're probably not going to branch out. Right. But we do have plans to branch out like that. That mm -hmm. is something I'd like to do. And what's almost certainly going to happen is like the first half of the back end developer career path. It's like the first eight or nine courses. This is I'm kind of mm -hmm. lumping in this memory management course. Um, not at all back end specific. Like right. this is just stuff that I think makes you a good developer, like understanding right. computer science basics, understanding how hardware works. Like I don't care mm -hmm. what you're going to go do. You probably should understand this if you want to be like, a good engineer. <laughs> yeah. Or like on the path to becoming a good engineer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like the, the, the later things change, right? Like you don't necessarily Definitely. need to learn Kubernetes if you're writing for embedded systems. But I think a lot of the foundational stuff that unfortunately, I'd argue it's a ZERP in some ways, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, zero interest rate phenomenon that people like were so egregiously skipping like fundamentals for a few years. And I think one of the best ways that you can really stand out at the moment is by not doing that because most people yeah. are not not doing that right and i think it shows that you are willing to learn stuff which i like is a skill and like sort of thing that you would want to have if you're planning on hiring someone particularly a junior dev is like one thing that's really valuable is you can prove that you want to learn things and you're excited to learn things like i would way rather hire someone with no javascript experience like you know for front end thing right like say they took boot dev i would way rather hire someone who's like i really want to learn and they show me that they learn as opposed to someone's like i've been writing javascript for six months and i don't care about anything you're like oh i don't know like i can teach the person who wants to learn javascript but i might not be able to teach the person who's not interested in learning the new thing that we're going to do at work right and so there's there's something really i think about being able to talk about things that you're learning and it's been successful for me at least and i think that that's a really like effective strategy, particularly of getting your foot in the door at places where there it is a junior role of just being like, I'm willing to learn whatever, you know, I and will like, do okay. anything. Yeah, right. For knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I will. I want the knowledge. So I think that's also a really sort of like key trait I would look for in a junior is like curiosity and willingness to learn. No, I mean anything. <laughs> all right is this still recording are we still live uh, Am I getting funked? <laughs> so i want to repeat that point because i actually think it was yep. really really good um especially <laughs> at the junior level so <laughs> yes. not my nonsense your yes, point right. is the one i want back, back to what i was saying <laughs> at the senior level a lot of times you're hiring for expertise right like yep. we're doing something with technology maybe internally we, we haven't even done, used this technology that much before so we're like hiring someone and we really want them to hit the ground running and be almost to be able to teach us how to do it. That happens mm -hmm. a lot at like the, the staff level, the senior level. At the yeah, we're just level, be able to operate like without oversight, right? We right. just tell you to go solve this problem and then you go solve it, right? That, yeah. At the junior level, it's a completely different attitude. It's like we're hiring someone and we just want to make sure that like over the next year or two, they become really effective. And a lot of times you're like trying to find diamonds in the rough, right? So Whenever I hire juniors, at least, it's it's way less about what you know now, and it's more about what I think you're going to be able to know in six to 12 months. And so this idea of demonstrating that you are a fast learner, that you do care, that you do that you are curious matters, I would argue, even more at the entry level. I think, generally speaking, you're going to learn better if you understand fundamentals, right? So it's just like, you know, if you're playing sports, if you play basketball, doesn't matter like how athletic you, you are. If your fundamentals are bad, you'll like probably just lose to someone whose fundamentals is good. Right. And so I think the same thing is true for software development stuff, like over the long haul, like it's possible that the first project is going to be solved by the person who like happens to have that knowledge, but like will project two and three and adapting and figuring out how to fix, you know, okay. But, like all I know is, you know, react with, hooks and then react releases a new thing super class components or something i don't know right and then you need to like change everything do you have the the knowledge fundamentals to sort of switch between these ideas right or react introduces signals or something right are you going to be able to like figure all of that out or is it you just had sort of this blind copy paste attitude that you had before and then that keeps you stuck same thing for like any you know any different 
any sort of different thing. And I think learning those fundamentals helps you adapt and solve like project two and project three down the line, which is why like, it, I think it also makes sense for companies like hire curious people because you don't know what your problems are going to look like in six months. They could be completely different. Uh, and an even more apt example is, you know, Dota two fundamentals. Like for example, oh, your, your true. fundamentals aren't very good. And, That's not true. I played like bad cop. four game win streak. <laughs> I'm on a four game win streak. <laughs> like your last hitting is is like fifty percent, right? No, it's better than I that. look <laughs> I look over, bad cops like four levels higher than you in the game. I'm just kidding. I sandbagged the last game we played together. You it was did. pretty bad. He was literally doing shopping. He was in his shopping cart. <laughs> And then we died because of it and lost the game. If Not even the in-game shopping clips. cart. I was actually on Amazon.com tabbed out of the game. <laughs> <laughs> I was just alt tabbed thinking, dang, I really need to order some new bubble water. And then all of a sudden we died. You know, I thought that I'd be dead for longer. I have more time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. And then the ancient was gone. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, weird. No, I've been getting a lot of questions about, you know, th those Dota 2 games. Like, I, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, same, same. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I'm super excited for the course. Um, <laughs> I like how we ended. Just like <laughs> dropping in. Wait, for context, Lane and I have been playing Dota 2 together. <laughs> uh, and not audience. writing courses. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, everybody. So, yeah, if, hey, if you want the course and you're thinking, where's that course, DJ? You can blame this guy because <laughs> Lane is the one that was been bothering me. Hey, play some Dota 2 with us. And now I'm like, you hit me uh, up at one o'clock in the afternoon. Like <laughs> <laughs> two days ago, I was like, I'm literally deploying the shells and terminals course right now. Yeah, that's that did happen. But like, think about before that, right? Which was when you said I should play. And then I hadn't played a real game in a long time. So anyways, that's, that's the context. And I gave you that alive. first cigarette. Yes, after it had been right. years he's, and now he, you're trying to make me an addict he's the drug dealer and all the like you know kids <laughs> propaganda ones that he's like giving out drugs for free you know <laughs> like he's like here kids here's some free drugs start playing dota 2 again no I'm, no! I'm like dude, it's so dumb because i'm like anti-incentivized because the sooner you drop that course the exactly. sooner boot dev does better Yes, uh, exactly. Cool, it's, right, it's coming soon. Don't worry. Yeah. We're starting on it full time in in like just over a week, you know, so it's very yeah. exciting. Yeah. By the time this drops, you will be a full time content creator. True. We'll have hopefully already done the full NeoVim user manual read through as well. February 5. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> is the on stream RTFM. Yeah. And the, but if you're listening to this late, Hopefully I have it up on Audible. I'm going to put it as an audio book no, for everybody. Gonna yeah, I'm going <laughs> to put it as an audio book. <laughs> so if I have it, I'll send it to Lane. It'll be in the link. Of this. <laughs> the link will be in the description. Oh, my goodness. So We have hopefully. to like give a prize, like a Boots plushie to someone if they oh, actually listen to that whole thing. That would be really funny. <laughs> it, we can link it at the end. Additional materials. <laughs> NeoVim course is just the audio book. <laughs> In the Shells and Terminals read. course, in the very last assignment, I, I yeah. get everyone to install NeoVim. They they oh, edit one file nice. with it, but it is I'm I'm pumping nice. those download numbers. So nice. Maybe we should we should have a curl command where they can download the audio book <laughs> to their <laughs> local thing and play it. <laughs> Welcome it just... to User Manual Chapter One with your host TJ DeVries. <laughs> read by not not the author yeah not the author by the way cool all right i'm gonna let you go thanks again Sweet. for coming on i know this episode yeah. is gonna gonna do some numbers people loved your first one so oh this thank be you thanks we didn't make fun of haskell enough though so we'll have to come back on again later and i'll like fulfill my quota you know we'll be hopefully doing you know eventually if you want to hear an ocaml course too you know you got to leave us a, you got to leave us a comment say I listened all the way to the end. I love the episode so much. TJ is so handsome and I want an OCaml course. That's how we'll know they made it to here. TJ in spends the, all his time in the back end banter YouTube video comment section. So please yeah. go leave a I'm comment there every for day. TJ. Yeah. I've been refreshing my first one. You guys aren't leaving <laughs> enough comments on there anymore. <laughs> Dude, Lane. What? We didn't even say my promo code. Promo code teach on boot.dev. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Hello? <laughs> if if you want 25% off, 25% off your first month or year, promo code TEEJ. It's spelled in a ridiculous manner. It's T-E-E-J. Give you a little discount. It'll give 
TJ a little bit of an incentive to actually work on the course instead of playing Dota with me. Yeah, and you can find me everywhere else at TJ underscore DV, but underscores like aren't allowed in URLs and stuff. It's kind of weird. Promo codes. It's just no. broken. Well, and like just, but anyway, so you can find me there everywhere else, basically. So thanks, Lane. Thanks. I'm glad we remembered to do this plug. Yes, that would have been, been terrible for your finances. All right. Yeah. Peace. Peace.